front lines of the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, buenvenidos a todos. Uh, mi nombre es Roberto Mucaro Borrero. Soy del pueblo taíno. Uh, soy un boriquen taíno y soy, voy a, a servir como moderador de, del webinario hoy uh, en título Los Jóvenes Indígenas en el Frente Ante la Crisis de la COVID-19. Uh, momentito porque necesitamos uh, explicar algunas instrucciones instrucciones para la función de interpretación de la plataforma de Zoom. Voy a empezar en inglés primero y después en uh, resumen en español. Uh, greetings, everyone. I just want to just take a moment uh, for those of you who are just turn, uh, tuning in for the first time, just quickly to explain the Zoom interpretation feature. Our program will be um, coming to you with simultaneous translation, uh, English to Spanish, Spanish to English. And um, what we're going to do, I'm going to share my screen right now so that we can follow through the instructions, first in English, then uh, quickly in Spanish. Okay, if you look at your screen here, uh, for those who speak English and who need to hear the English interpretation, uh, first of all, you need to locate the interpretation icon. It's at the bottom right of your screen. And this is what the image will look like. You'll see a little globe there. And you'll need, when you click on that globe, uh, you'll need to select English. And then uh, very importantly, after that, again, this is very important, you need to select mute original audio. So here's the image here, select English, and then you'll need to select mute original audio. And that will stop you from hearing both languages at the same time. So English speakers, click English and then mute original audio. If you do not have that function, you'll need to start up your computer again and get the most recent um, version of, of Zoom. Okay, now I'm just gonna switch uh, very quickly to Spanish for those who are tuning in and don't know who need these instructions. So please just uh, your patience for another uh, couple of minutes. Y para los que hablan español, uh, aquí tú puedes uh, ver uh, una imagen que dice aquí, localice el, icon, el icono de interpretación. Está en la parte inferior derecha de su pantalla. Aquí en la en el, en la imagen tú puedes mirar un, un glo, globito y abajo de ese globito dice interpretación. Entonces, seleccione ahí, aquí es la imagen, seleccione español aquí y después, y esto es muy importante, Apaga el audio original. En inglés es mute original audio. Y eso es muy importante porque si no, no haga eso, vas a escuchar los dos idiomas en el mismo vez. Y uh, uh, después de, de todo eso, si tienes, si quieres uh, comunicar conmigo o, o alguno de los panelistas en español, puede usar el icono de chat. Y aquí tú puedes ver eh, la imagen que dice chat. Uh, this is again for... Uh, Voy a volver otra vez en inglés uh, porque tenemos uh, traducción. Okay, uh, thank you for your patience with that. I uh, just was uh, saying at the end of those instructions that um, if you want to send any messages or comments during any of the presentations, uh, you use this uh, chat feature. And you'll find that again uh, at the bottom of your screen, you just click on chat. And uh, that will get, uh, that you'll be able to, uh, to uh, just type out your questions there, and then uh, myself or uh, the other host will be able to uh, take those questions on. So with that uh, instructions uh, completed, I'll stop sharing my screen. And then the, the other item before we begin and I introduce our first speaker for today, also very important, up at the top right of your screen, you should have a view icon. If you kind of click over that, and uh, you'll see something that says gallery view. Uh, it says speaker view up there in the, in the top right hand corner. Click on gallery view. Uh, why I'm recommending that is because since we have translation, when the Spanish speakers are speaking, also the translators will be speaking. And if you wanna see the person speaking at the same time, you need to have it in gallery view so that you can see the speaker and the, and the translator. So with that, I, I will stop the introductions. I thank you very much uh, for your patience uh, with that. And I will introduce our uh, first speaker, uh, Chris Honani, who's gonna give it uh, an overview 
of today's program. Uh, Chris is Hopi Dene. He's an administrative and programs assistant for the International Indian Treaty Council. Uh, he's uh, calling in from Tucson, Arizona. Chris, you have the floor. Good morning, everybody. Yate Bene, Lamatalangwa, Nip Chris Manani and Ban Matsu, and Lamaki Bayan, Hopi Matsu, Nip Kosefana, Tilby F. Kita. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Chris Manani. I am Dene uh, and Hopi. I am originally from Tuba City, Arizona. Um, currently, I work as the program and admin assistant with the International Indian Treaty Council. And um, I have been really looking forward to today's webinar, um, which will feature youth uh, presenters uh, from uh, different indigenous communities um, from across the world. And so today, um, what we really wanted to discuss um, is uh, the impacts uh, on youth by the COVID-19 crisis. Um, Today, it, it seems as if uh, the situation changes um, constantly. Um, something new seems to happen every day. A new crisis, a new challenge is presented to us, um, it seems like, um, by the day. And so as youth, um, it's, it's a little challenging to comprehend what's going on in the world now. Um, this year so far has been a year unlike any other that I have lived in. Um, I'm 25 years old, um, but I believe I, I was reading a, a statistic somewhere saying that um, people under the age of 30 have gone through uh, and are currently going through uh, two different uh, recessions, uh, economic recessions, and um, various uh, uh, crises that have occurred um, in the world. And so today, I, I, I really want to see if we can discuss um, what real challenges are being presented to Indigenous youth across the world. Um, and and um, for most Indigenous communities, uh, we are being impacted disproportionately by the COVID-19 crisis compared to other, um, other uh, uh, communities across the world. And um, what we want to be able to do is to look to our indigenous cultures, our identities, our languages, to find the solutions to cope with um, the challenges that we are facing today. And um, one of the things that I have been really considering and thinking about as well is what impacts um, has this crisis presented on my mental, spiritual, emotional, and physical health um, I think uh, it's really important to, to consider uh, indigenous youth's uh, mental, spiritual, and emotional health in this time of crisis. Um, many of our indigenous youth um, are being challenged with mental health issues. And, and, and um, right now, the crisis is making things a lot worse for indigenous youth. but in my eyes, in my perspective, I see indigenous youth and elders as having the keys to finding the solutions to this crisis and to getting through it stronger and healthier. And so um, not only do we want to talk about the impacts, but we also want to talk about the solutions and what work is being done on the front lines by our um, youth panelists today. So. Um, again, thank you all for joining us today. It is a, it is a great pleasure to be able to introduce um, the, the topic that we are discussing today. And um, I look forward to having a very meaningful and uh, effective uh, conversation today. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chris for uh, providing us with that introduction. And uh, the next item on our agenda is um, the showcasing of a video that was put together by indigenous youth around the world by the International Indigenous uh, Youth Caucus. 
and uh, that's uh, Voices of Indigenous uh, Youth uh, in the COVID-19 pandemic. And I think, Chris, you'll be starting that uh, video. Yes. And uh, yeah, so we'll just take it away from there. Uh, and just let, let Chris, before we start the video, I, I apologize. This seems to be some folks who are still having an issue with, uh, with the interpretation. If you restart your, your Zoom, restart it, you should uh, get the most updated version of Zoom. And that should have the icon for interpretation. So uh, please try to do that um, because otherwise you'll continue to hear both, both uh, languages. If you don't uh, pick your language and the mute original audio. Again, you need to mute your original audio as well as picking your language. Thank you. And I apologize for, for that delay, Chris. Um, you can start the video. Young people are not immune. We can carry the virus in the lives of all elders at the risk. We help our elders by running their errands for them and picking up necessities so that they can avoid crowded spaces. Um, we chop their voice, we use seats for them to plant, um, as well as asking them to share stories either over the phone or from afar. We find creative ways to support them while protecting them from exposure. ဒီဘာဘိုဘာတက်ကြီးရောလိုနေတာဆီဘနီကိုသူ့မီကောင်းကျန်းမှာရှိပါရင်လာလေးကျွန်တော်တို့ပြီးဆိုင်ရင်
uh, so the translators were not hearing the translation on English? Yeah, I was just telling her to, to uh, start up her mic. Okay, we're ready. Okay, you have the floor. She's speaking in her language. My name is Jessica Vega. I am from the Mixteco people of Oaxaca, San Domingo, And I also live in the Valle de Charco. It's the state of Mexico. It's an area that's close to the city of Mexico City and one of the areas that's been most affected by this pandemic. So I thank you very much for inviting me to speak here and to share our thoughts and the perspectives of indigenous youth. We are aware that our world and our regions are experiencing difficulties because of COVID-19. And in view of this, I would first like to acknowledge the historical resilience of our indigenous peoples, our communities and our territories because of what we're facing during this pandemic and also the res resilience of the many different pandemics that we have faced throughout time. And I also want to remember in this space that we are continuing to find, to face a very difficult time of vulnerability of our rights in spite of our historical struggle to protect our rights for our collective rights, individual rights for indigenous peoples. And as indigenous youth, we have done a variety of things throughout many years in order to integrate our agendas and our uh, concerns, especially like Agenda 2030. And we see this as a priority is very important to continue to integrate these different ideas in these spaces to talk about the equ equity of gender, eradication of poverty, hunger, to talk about peace, just to mention some of the objectives that we're talking about for sustainable de development that we've been talking about during the last few years. However, in order to be able to comply or fulfill these objectives, we have to look for the commitment from the states. Because on one end, we have the agendas that are very important, like they're key in our agenda 2030 to advance in the rights. But then we also have the mobilization against uh, the violation of human rights. And for indigenous youth, it's very important to remember that this pandemic has allowed us to see the inequality, the discrimination, the racism, the division of classes, the fundamental, um, the fundamentalists that are coming out. And we see that this is all really important. As indigenous people, we have seen re realities like the criminalization for talking about these topics of uh, human rights. And these also is, is a pandemic. This is also a danger as well as, as bad as COVID-19. So we continue to have the um, challenges even more than now. We have to highlight the values that we treasure in order to protect our rights. The commitments should be mutual. As indigenous peoples, we are committed, as you see in this video, you saw in the video that we just saw, not just with our words, but also with our actions. We are very committed, but we also need to include the commitments of the states in order to protect our individual and collective rights that I'm talking to you about, especially for children and indigenous youth. From the Indigenous Caucus, our regions and our organizations, uh, grassroots organizations, we have added many of our efforts to look for ways to prevent and to contain the virus in order so that we are not um, contaminating one another or sharing this infection. But in Latin America, it has, we have seen as one of the focal points of this pandemic, even though it's not well known. And as the Indigenous Global Caucus, it's very difficult uh, to carry forward 
multiple actions when we're also seeing the necessity from our communities and the different regions, all the needs that we have. And for example, in Latin America, we have worked with the indigenous uh, youth network of the Caribbean and Latmerk and Phylak and Abayala have constructed in order to gather our forces together and that we can make an impact at the worldwide level and also at the regional and local level. We have looked for uh, cross-cutting ideas in order to affect the youth and also our communities, but it's also been difficult to find a, a proper answer. And although the Latin America is the center of the focal point of this pandemic, and it's so hard for us to hear how our brothers and sisters are being affected throughout the world, so we have to highlight the importance of our ancestral knowledge in some way have allowed us to continue with our resistance as indigenous peoples. Our food systems, our medicinal plants have helped us greatly. However, it's not the only thing that we need to talk about. We also need to follow up with, especially with actions from health measures. We need to be well informed in order to share with the community. And this is something that our my brothers and sisters will share with you that are the uh, co-chairs with me at the Indigenous Caucus. And so what, how we're trying to spread the word, socialize this information, and we need to continue to strengthen our forces. So it's also important to spread the word within our own languages with brochures by word of mouth. As we mentioned, in order to make this uh, more concrete information and in order for our people to be more comfortable receiving this information. And we also have to strive to be more harmonious at the personal, family, and community level. So I thank you for the support and your solidarity of my indigenous brothers and sisters throughout the world, especially the youth, because we have been on co communicating with one another constantly in order to strengthen one another, because that's also an impact to see how our brothers and sisters and their health is being affected and to think about the difficulty that we're going through. As Indigenous youth, we highlight that solidarity is one of our ancestral values and human rights are also values within our communities and our, ancestor, and our ancestral communities. So we need to use these ancestral values. So we need to take positive steps forward as part of the co-chair uh, presidency of the Indigenous Co Global Caucus, it's important to look for these strategies, but we also know that these efforts have to be joined together with the uh, intergenerational knowledge and other measures. So we are also looking for ways to start uh, looking for funds for the Indigenous Global Cau Youth Caucus, not for us personally, but it, for us to be able to share. We don't gather, we don't get funds from anybody, but we have the love for our people, the love for identity. And even though there's some negative attitudes that we've seen to, during these last few weeks that we've lived within the context of the pandemic, we can also look for, look for something better for our Mother Earth. And in that way, it's important to talk about in the next campaign where we're going to look for funds in order to look for funds to support our people with biosecurity to avoid the disappearance of our cultures. It's important for us as indigenous peoples to talk about that we are together as the indigenous youth and we have the intergenerational knowledge that we have gathered from our ancestors and our elders, but we need to continue to add strength and effort to this. So as our brothers and sisters, my um, colleagues that are going to share in their messages that are coming forward next, um, they're showing how they're working. But however, we still feel the need to look for better strategies because the pain that we're feeling when we see our communities affected th this way within this pandemic, it really just affects us deeply in our hearts. And we've been fighting for so many years. And I believe that we need to continue strong and united. Thank you very much. And I believe that we will be able to do this during this pandemic. Thank you.
Thank you very much uh, for your presentation, Jessica. Our next speaker is calling in from Kenya. And uh, I have the pleasure to introduce Carson Kiburu. He's a Global Indigenous Youth Caucus co-chair. Co um, Carson, you have the floor. Well, uh, thank you, Roberto. Um, greetings, everyone. Uh, good morning. Good evening. Uh, good afternoon and good evening and I'm very pleased you could join us in this webinar as we shine a light on the interventions by the indigenous youth in this COVID-19 um, crisis and so um, Chris could you uh, share the screen or I can just run through okay Good, okay, so thank you so much. So, uh, yeah, so uh, first, well, we see, go to the next slide, please. Um, so, uh, here's the situation um, of, as how we see uh, as indigenous youth. Uh, indigenous peoples have been hit hard by the COVID-19 and its socioeconomic effects. Uh, first, we see mental health challenges, um, again, it's already a pre-existing pre uh, issue. We see that is a socioeconomic effect. Uh, we see serious violations of rule of law uh, as has been aggravated by lack of opportunities to organize. Um, let's go to the next one. Uh, uh, the healthcare reactionary legislations that are illegal in the pretext of containing the virus. Uh, due to postponement or so of the cancel uh, cancellation of UN meetings and other mechanisms, uh, the indigenous people's movement space continues to grow thin. And uh, we, we, we have stepped up uh, as indigenous youth. And what we think is, uh, for instance, we see how uh, communities that have been hit, for example, uh, in the US, uh, we see the Navajo Nation, that has borne the brand heavily. Uh, in Africa, some countries denied the existence of COVID-19, therefore blocking official reports and any help that might uh, uh, help these communities. Uh, we also see police uh, uh, brutality while enforcing the curfew and lockdowns, a case in point uh, in Kenya. Uh, also, um, uh, there's a neglect on pre-existing threats, uh, like the people, uh, like for example, my people, uh, the Endorais and the El Chamuzu are now facing killings, uh, livestock thefts, um, floods and rising water levels in their lake systems. Uh, these are issues that were pre-existing uh, threats, but now uh, states or member states of the United Nations, or even countries that uh, have the authority and the trust of uh, uh, citizens uh, are not uh, stepping up and helping these people. Uh, of course, uh, more of the effort is, uh, is directed into COVID-19 pandemic, but what happens to issues that were pre-existing, for example? Um, so uh, what are we doing as indigenous youth? Uh, in, this, in the spirit of seven generations, we are concerned uh, of our uh, people's existence. Uh, we want to carry the sense of belonging that is in us, uh, ancestral sense of belonging, our great grandparents, uh, our grandparents, our parents, or, and the future generation. Uh, that is what inspires us. It keeps us doing what we do. Uh, and what my sisters uh, mentioned about the video that you were shown in the beginning of this webinar. Uh, we have uh, developed culturally relevant messages to keep our people safe in collaboration with those who stand with us. Uh, we also take care of our elders and we tap into traditional knowledge in their um, enviable rich custody. Uh, this goes without saying that of course, we all know that our elders have a ton of knowledge, even in managing this crisis, and they have the, uh, the calmness of the spirit, the calmness of uh, the mental uh, strength, and that is how we share, and we have to take care of our elders. Uh, we also emphasize safe food systems, 
uh, and explore ways of enhancing our voices as we meaningfully uh, engage. Uh, of course, uh, such as such partnerships as created by our brother Victor, who is going to be who's going to be speaking after me, uh, with friends from Harvard Medical School. Indigenous youth have built relationships with a number of UN agencies and uh, other non-governmental agencies to help in the COVID-19 crisis. And within ourselves, we have harnessed expertise in areas such as law, uh, governance, food security, and economics. We think uh, about mitigating uh, the short-term and long-term effects of uh, the COVID-19. Uh, certainly, we all know that this is a passing storm, and that is the spirit that the youth are hunkering on. Uh, we are mobilizing resources, reaching out, and helping the most vulnerable. Um, so uh, how does the future look like? Uh, without concerted, concerted effort in our movement as indigenous peoples, we risk being trampled upon by neocolonial and repressive regimes. As mentioned uh, earlier, uh, I said that we see uh, pre-existing uh, threats uh, that are just now led to whoever was threatening the indigenous peoples now have the go ahead. And so if we don't stand together, uh, we will be trampled upon, uh, upon by these uh, uh, repressive regimes, for example. And there is hope in coming together in the spirit of those who come before us in the indigenous people's movement. And we are inspired, for example, by uh, elders, eldest brothers uh, and sisters who are in this call, for example, who have organized this webinar. And uh, the history that you have shared with us before, and that inspires us and give, gives us the energy to move forward. And so we continue writing statements and organizing and mobilizing using the spaces that we have right now as indigenous youth. Uh, so uh, I have a, a few lessons like uh, that I thought of. Uh, one, uh, our ancient life ways have always been a powerful handbook for our lifestyles, crisis management and survival. More than ever, uh, let's pay attention to uh, our traditional knowledge. How I, uh, as I, I, I can't emphasize this enough because we already know that our life ways, as always we've talked about as indigenous peoples, it's rich in, um, it's rich in, in, in knowledge, in, in, in wisdom and everything. Yeah, sure. So. Uh, Urban living uh, also offers enormous challenges in terms of uh, the pandemic. For example, uh, we see a lot of youth who are working in urban centers and now uh, they cannot access uh, the employment that they were in. Uh, what happens? And so this is a challenge and we share, I share having learned and having being told by a number of our members and, and youth all over uh, the globe. I know this is a great challenge, and so uh, if you get any, if you have any questions and thoughts, I, uh, I I am available to share a light more on what we just mentioned. Uh, yes, and so thank you for your time and for effort for for in, for this opportunity to share these uh, ideas, and so uh, grateful. So thank you so much. Thank you very much, Carson, for sharing that information with us and for sharing your perspectives. Uh, before I introduce the next speaker, uh, again, I just want to remind folks, if you're just tuning in about the interpretation feature, you'll need to go to the bottom of your screen, click on the interpretation icon, and click one of the languages, either English or Spanish. Those are the two interpretation options that we have. In addition to clicking on the language that you want to hear, you'll also need to mute your original audio. Again, mute your original audio. If you don't do that, you will continue to hear both languages at the same time. Also, uh, related to the, the issue of interpretation, I would recommend that you go up to the top uh, right corner of your screen to speaker view and click on gallery view. This will allow you to see the speaker uh, even while there's interpretation going. Uh, you won't see a black box and then uh, you know one of the speakers as they, they continue. You'll be able to see all the speakers and you'll uh, be able to see 
uh, who the person is talking. Okay, with that in mind, I, I will stop those instructions and uh, introduce, introduce our next speaker. I have the pleasure to introduce Anidalia Betty Martinez. She's a representative of the CUNA Youth Movement, calling in from Panama. Uh, Betty, uh, you have the floor. Whenever you're ready, just unmute your microphone and you can begin. Inidalia is giving a greeting in her Kuna language. My name is Inidalia Martinez from Panama, from the Kuna Youth Movement. Greetings to all of you, to all of our brothers and sisters here. It is a pleasure to be here and participate in this forum. And I send greetings to all of the IITC members. My name is Enidalia Betty Martinez. I'm from Panama City, originally from the community of Ustupo in the Kuna territory. And I am the general coordinator of the Kuna Youth Movement. First of all, I would just like to speak a little bit about the COVID-19 crisis and our organization. Our organization has was formed 48 years ago uh, to support our youth generation. I think many of you know some of our brothers and sisters. The audio is cut out a little bit, but we'll continue interpreting the speech. I'm sure many of you know Dana Edman who worked for many years in the uh, civil society mechanism on food sovereignty issues. Also, our brother uh, Manny is also part of the IITC food sovereignty work. And today I want to speak a little bit about our topic and how we as youth are facing the COVID-19 crisis. And, this really began on March 9th in Panama City. Uh, Panama is one of the most vulnerable countries in, that has been affected by this pandemic in Central America. And the Cunayala Comarca has also been affected. So the Cuna leadership decided to close off the territory and prohibit tourists from entering to stop the pandemic. This took place through our national health agency in order to confront the pandemic. Also in the Cunayala territory, the health infrastructure is not good. We do not have hospitals. We only have health posts. We don't have the supplies and the necessary equipment. We do not have the specialized doctors who can attend to our communities, to attend to our brothers and sisters who are suffering the effects of this pandemic. In spite of the fact that we have rights recognized by the United Nations as indigenous peoples, our rights have been valid, have been violated, and we are not being taken into account as indigenous peoples and also in Panama City. We are facing this reality. And many have gone into the streets to protest the fact that we don't have water, we don't have work. Unemployment situation has created a great imbalance. We don't have food. The supplies 
that the government here in Panama hands out do not reach everyone. If we, so we cannot get those bags of supplies. The supermarkets are linked to the huge corporations and we feel that we are being violated and we, as the Kuna Youth Movement Organization, seek to help. That's what we're working on. We're seeking donations. To help our brothers and sisters, because in the Kunayala territory known as the Comarca, they have been hit very hard in Cartisulo and in the community of Aligardi. And I want to stress what our sister Jessica was saying. We need solidarity as indigenous brothers and sisters to support our communities. There are communities that don't have any cases who have donated food, fish, bananas in solidarity with our communities. And that's why as an organization, this is what we have sought to do. And we have encouraged cultivation of seeds with our brothers and sisters in Mali Garandi so that we can cooperate in this cultivation of food for our communities. Also, we have social networks available for communication so that we can make our voice heard so that we are visible and we're not invisible. That's why it's so important that we as indigenous youth retake our identity, our indigenous identity and community. And that's what we're struggling for. When this pandemic began, we were working on our development of our training we worked with, uh, we had training with our brother Francisco Cali on human rights. And we spoke a bit on that. We also had the brother, the opportunity to hear our brother, Carlos Chek, and our other representatives who came to speak and train us on these issues. And we confront the issues of the racism that we as indigenous, people are facing. And so now in Panama and Kunayala, we are creating a virtual platform so that our artisans can sell their works since they cannot go out because of the pandemic and they're limited by that. So we want to have this virtual platform so that we can help in this way that we can provide supplies to communities that are affected. We need things such as alcohol, masks, gloves for our communities. And finally, before I close, I want to invite you on for Sunday, the 14th, we will have the first Latin American rap festival. Our Mapuche brothers will be participating. People from different indigenous communities will be participating. And we would like to ask for your support for uh, any small help you can provide. We have also had the help and contributions from our brothers and sisters here in Panama and our indigenous community who have given donations. And so we're asking for donations. And I would just like to thank you all very much for your presence. Thank you very much for giving me the floor for this short presentation and thank you. Thank you very much, Jenny, for that presentation and for highlighting everything that your community is going through at the moment. Okay, we have just a couple of announcements before we introduce our next speaker. One is that um, some of the presentations that you've been seeing, the PowerPoints, 
Uh, they will be available at the IITC website. We will uh, be posting them there, uh, as well as the contact information uh, for each of the speakers. You'll be able to get in touch with them uh, directly if you would like to follow up. So with that in mind, I would like to introduce, I have the honor to introduce our next speaker, Jaden Walito, who's Dene from the New Mexico Navajo and Hopi's Family COVID Relief Unit. Jessica, when you're ready, unmute and you have the floor. Hello, everybody. My name is Jada Moreto. I am Bitter Water, born for Coyote Pass Clan. And my maternal grandfather is Nuete Hirata from the Three Affiliated Tribes in North Dakota. And my paternal grandfather is Water Birch Clan. Um, I am from Fort Defiance, Arizona, in the Navajo Nation. And I'm here representing as a youth volunteer for the Navajo and Hopi family COVID relief effort. Um, it is an indigenous grass led and volunteer um, operated relief funds and effort. And we are also working in collaboration with collective members from Kaimfo Shop, a Dene feminist collective in Sierra Hosana, or so-called Window Rock, Arizona. Our volunteer group is mostly youth run and based in Fort Defiance, Arizona and surrounding rural communities on the Navajo Nation. Here on the Navajo Nation, only 60% of households have running water. The remaining 40% must haul water, um, usually traveling far distances and many miles for their families and livestock. Resource extraction and exploitation continues to deplete much of our direct water sources that comes from aquifers, natural springs, rivers, and lakes. There are also over 500 abandoned uran uranium mines left open to contaminate these aquifers and wells. The lives, lands, and natural rights of Dene and Hopi people have been sacrificed so the capitalist economy of the Southwest United States may thrive. Um, the Navajo Nation is about 27,000 square miles, roughly the same size as West West Virginia, and there are only 13 grocery stores to feed over 244,000 people. There are also only 10 continuously understaffed, under-equipped, and underfunded hospitals within the Navajo Nation. Almost one-third of homes within the Navajo Nation lack electricity, internet, and cell phone services. Most of these same households live on 10 gallons of water a day, where the average American uses 100 gallons. <laughs> The socioeconomic conditions of life on the reservation exacerbates the high mortality rate of disease among indigenous people due to extremely limited access to clean water, unpolluted land, and fresh organic foods. The infrastructure is inadequate and a lot of roads are unpaved, so volunteer delivery drivers um, have to drive on these roads for long, um, long distances and their vehicles um, sometimes can't make it or they give out. All indigenous, all indigenous nations have been subject to the abuse created by net United States policies to deny indigenous people their ability to determine their own futures. This virus also disproportionately affects our elders who are our knowledge keepers, our Dine language speakers, our matriarchs and medicine people. And often our medicine people carry immense knowledge of ceremonies that take years and decades and sometimes lifetimes to learn. And this is what is at stake. And this is why we work for the people. So future generations can speak the Nebizad, Navajo language, and so that we can attend ceremony and that we can have clean water to drink and that we can cultivate the land to bring food security into our homes. Right now, the Navajo Nation currently has the most COVID-19 infections per capita ahead of New York and New Jersey. Our Dene-centric ideology is Ke. Ke means kinship and refers to effective action and solidarity, including compassion, kindness, friendliness, generosity, and peacefulness. Through our efforts, we are reciprocating good kinship and Ke. 
through Indigenous mutual aid and philosophy. Um, indigenous mutual aid means a fair allocation of resources and not supporting systems of hierarchy, such as capitalism over another. We are encouraging self-education, skill sharing, and self-sufficiency, not for personal wealth or gain, but to be able to give this knowledge back to the community and for the health of ourselves, families, and relatives. Mutual aid ensures a healthy and dignified life for everyone because everyone deserves this. This also means not taking more than what is necessary. Every week, our volunteers work long and sometimes exhausting days of storing food and other necessities and then putting them into boxes to be delivered to community members, families, elders, um, single parents, and families with children. Um, and we prioritize people who are high risk or people who are COVID positive so that they don't have to go out into the community to the grocery stores to buy their food or haul their own water. Um, and that they can, this ensures that they can self isolate. Um, this crisis gives our nation an opportunity to decentralize power structures and to not replicate imbalances of power shown in capitalism and colonialism. And we can start to imagine what the foundation of life would be without these monsters. We strive to recenter our purpose of upholding healthy and dignified lives for all based on kinship and human and non-human relatives. I'm really thankful and I'm grateful to the volunteers at the COVID-19 Navajo and Hopi Families Relief Effort and to Campbell Shop for showing their, and their kinship towards me and other volunteers. I've created a lot of meaningful friendships and relationships through this work and it is exhausting at times and we have long days and there's a lot of work that needs to be done but we do it with this in our hearts with gratitude and love for our people in our hearts and so i want to say and and thank you for having me here on the panel thank you so much Aiden, for sharing that update and and uh, those views from your community Again, uh, to your community and to all the presenters here today, you know, we always just keep sending our good thoughts and prayers. We know that the communities are going through so much right now. And of course, uh, we have you all in our hearts as we have our own communities in our hearts. And as, as uh, you've all indicated during this program, this is a time for solidarity, uh, physical, uh, spiritual, and otherwise. And uh, we thank you very much once again, uh, Jaden and everyone. Our last uh, speaker uh, right now, uh, we're, uh, we were expecting, uh, as I mentioned in the beginning of our program, uh, the Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples to provide an update. He hasn't signed in as yet, um, so we will continue on with our speakers. And right now I have the pleasure, the great pleasure to introduce Victor Lopez Carmen. He's Dakota Anyaki. He's the Global Indigenous Youth Caucus co-chair and he's a Harvard medical student. Victor, great to see you, you have the floor. I'm Pet Duaste, thank you, Roberto. Thank you so much. Um, it's really an honor to be here and um, to learn from fellow indigenous youth leaders and elders alike. And thank you so much for having me here. Um, I prepared a PowerPoint and uh, I was wondering if I could ask the organizers to share it. And uh, I can, I'm gonna be going through uh, some of our efforts in the Global Indigenous Youth Caucus and our partnerships that we've made to try to respond to uh, this worldwide crisis in indigenous communities. Um, so you can go ahead and go to the next slide. So in the beginning when this was happening, um, I was still uh, studying at the medical school and I uh, was hearing from communities uh, already um, that you know they were being impacted at first um, many were being impacted by the virus, but also equally, if not greater, um, food insecurity from shutting down their borders. Um, at the same time, uh, I saw at the medical school uh, kind of a global response that, that I was seeing, you know, from my fellow students and professors and getting information from all over the world about communities that were suffering from this virus. And 
one thing that I didn't see at all was any information about indigenous peoples. And this reflected to me how our issues globally um, have been made invisible. That even at one of the premier medical institutions in the world, um, there's no mention of indigenous peoples. And we know that this is not just something that uh, is new um, because in our curriculum and in medical school curriculums across the nation, you'll hardly ever see indigenous people's health um, brought up in class or in cases or in the data that we use to drive the way that we treat patients and that we um, discuss healing. And so I, I was hearing from my fellow indigenous youth leaders from around the world about all of these issues. We wanted to try to figure out something to do, um, how to, to respond to it. So we created this partnership between the Global Indigenous Youth Caucus and Harvard Medical School and various UN agencies and, and, and different partners to, to try to partner with uh, indigenous peoples on the response. You can go to the next slide. So this is just an idea of, of some of our partners that, that we wanted to, to have in place and that we have now. Um, just to give an idea of the wide network and the wide web that we cast uh, to try to, you know, to learn how to develop a response because we realized that a lot of the things that would have been helpful to already have in place um, were not in place. And that was kind of the, the, the way that we went about it to try to figure out what would be helpful and to learn as a group um, from, from various resources and expertise, um, what's the best way that we can respond because we know that this pandemic is gonna be with us for quite some time. The virus is gonna be here for quite some time. It's still spreading. Uh, at you know the, some of the highest rates that we've seen and the highest rates in indigenous communities around the world and this isn't the last pandemic that we will face um, as as human beings and we've had multiple pandemics in the past and we will have multiple pandemics in the future so it's important to try to develop some knowledge um, on how we deal with these things in the different times next slide so one of the first things we wanted to do was try to pinpoint a group of physicians and health experts. Um, we've had challenges with this because a lot of the health experts, um, you know, who are leading this battle at you know, various um, levels in the government or in the United Nations or even in medical schools and the leaders in this fight have very little understanding of indigenous peoples. And oftentimes the way that um, that aid is delivered to indigenous peoples is, is done in a way that assumes that, um, that we are lesser or it's done from a deficit approach um, in a way that they're giving something to us. And oftentimes there are, um, there are agreements attached to that aid that create some sort of power dynamic. So we wanted to pinpoint some elders and advisors um, who have direct experience with indigenous peoples um, to drive not only uh, creating information that is medically valid and verified um, and robust, but also that's um, culturally sensitive and done in a way where, where it's a true partnership and indigenous peoples are leading um, in, in this effort. You can go to the next slide. So th these are some of the partnerships that we have and um, one of the, the key points of the initiative, um, so we have um, about you know, 50 Harvard medical students, um, a lot of uh, physicians and a lot of indigenous youth on our team. And we wanted to find a way to, to do something specific with, with seven global indigenous communities and to kind of put a network in place that would be able to respond if something were to happen. Um, for some regions, it hasn't been as successful and some regions, haven't really um, reached out for, for the things that, that we wanted to provide and that's totally okay. And in other regions, our partners, we were able to help and we still are and we're able to partner with them. I know that um, uh, uh, Jaden spoke and we um, have a relationship with Janine on that team and uh, we were able to help them translate um, some information on masks sent from China into English and uh, it helped to help verify the um, the effectiveness of those masks sent from China. And so we're just doing small things like this. Um, but at the same time, each of these teams has Harvard Medical students and indigenous youth leaders leading 
um, these teams. And uh, I think it's just been powerful because a lot of these medical students have never worked with indigenous peoples and they're learning um, how powerful we really are and how beautiful and, and uh, how, you know, how vital we really are to this world. Um, and I feel like we're kind of breaking a cycle in the way that medicine, uh, Western medicine looks at indigenous communities and indigenous peoples from a deficit approach because a lot of these students are learning that now you need to let indigenous peoples lead, listen to them, instead of just coming to them with solutions that you made up without actually listening. And so um, I'm, I'm just, I'm hopeful that uh, in the future when these people are leaders in medicine and in their various fields, that um, this experience will, will help them when an indigenous patient comes into their clinic or when an indigenous um, community comes to talk to them about insurance um, in the government or in any other situation. Um, we can go to the next slide. So these are some of the, the things that uh, we put together that we're providing. We're doing culturally relevant translation. Um, as of now, I believe we have the largest um, uh, network of indigenous translators that I know of. Um, we have about 150 indigenous translators representing over 160 indigenous languages right now. And one of the key gaps in the res responding to the COVID-19 crisis was the fact that there was no formal um, uh, flow of information in indigenous languages or efforts from the, the highest levels to take into account indigenous peoples who don't speak major UN languages, don't read or don't write. Um, and this was, a, a, I think, I feel a key gap in, um, in, the, in the information flow about this virus and also a key gap in, in other medical um, uh, aspects and other aspects of, of medicine in general. And so we're trying to figure out how to develop uh, culturally sensitive but, but uh, accurate medical information about this virus and uh, translating it um, with the indigenous translators. We're doing local advocacy in Boston where the Harvard medical students are. Um, just a, a little vignette uh, in that that's kind of a microcosm of what's happening in the world, but in Boston, they set up a, a citywide task force to monitor the data for different races, um, for black communities, Latino, for Asian, um, LGBTQ, but they left out Native Americans. And you know, Boston is where the pilgrims first landed. And uh, at, on the shore of the Wampanoag, and I just, I found it very ironic. Um, and we have a meeting with the mayor next Tuesday and they're gonna now include Native Americans in that um, task force. And um, just, a, just a small example of some of the things that we're doing. Um, we're publishing articles with the UN, with each of the communities um, leading the, the, the writing of that, those articles to try to promote the advocacy of their issues. Um, we're doing fundraising streams. Um, we're do, hosting two webinars with the World Health Organization and uh, UNICEF on indigenous youth mental health during the pandemic and also with uh, um, the International Fund for Agricultural Development on food security and uh, a number of other things that that we're trying um, trying to get set up and again this is a learning process but um, I think that uh, stating that this initiative is a learning process is the best way to go about it because the truth is a lot of the the um, the ways that we're responding uh, they haven't been thought about before and it's totally new, but I think we're learning a lot of lessons that we can carry forward. We can go to the next slide. So this is just an example um, just of some of the languages um, that our translators are bringing to the table. And we recently got a grant uh, for $3,000 to pay indigenous translators on our team. Um, and we and you know our translators, uh, they come from over 50 countries around the world. Some of the languages that they speak, you know, are only spoken by 200 people or less. Some of them are spoken by, you know, over 10,000. Um, but we realize in this world today, indigenous languages are uh, evaporating, they're disappearing because of a lot of um, uh, well, colonization and its lingering impacts. But we wanted to try to figure out a way to, to use um, that disadvantage and to um, be able to pay uh, indigenous translators 
to who do speak those languages and give them an advantage that will help hopefully um, promote health in their communities, but also um, to be able to, to help in the revitalization of indigenous languages. Because once medicine, uh, I think there's a structural issue medicine needs to address and that's we need a formal medical translation in indigenous languages uh, on, a, on a wider scale and to be able to to be able to employ and pay indigenous peoples uh, who are experts in themselves to do that because it's creating a very wide gap in um, information but also care at all levels of the field. Um, so we can go to the next slide. So this is just an example of one of the videos we created. Um, you can go ahead and play the video and we, we're making a lot of these and uh, just You can go ahead and, it uh, uh, looks like there, there wasn't sound. Um, well, that's okay. Uh, we, can, we can move forward, but essentially um, we're creating public service announcements. We have people from John Hopkins Medical School, Cultural Survival, um, and other uh, um, Harvard physicians who are helping us to create scripts and then we send those scripts um, to indigenous youth and indigenous peoples to make sure they're culturally sensitive and relevant. Um, because a lot of the information that's been put out, for instance, um, wash your hands with water and soap. For a lot of indigenous communities, they don't have running water and they don't have soap. So information needs to be contextually relevant to actually be effective. And we're creating information um, that, that is um, to the best of our abilities. And uh, we have a website. Um, uh, we're, that's being developed. Hopefully that will be a hub for COVID-19 information in indigenous languages. Um, we're going to be creating a lot of the material, but we want to make it open source because we see a lot of uh, indigenous communities who have um, or organizations that have made some information in their languages and we want them to be able to submit um, the things that they've made so that indigenous peoples from anywhere um, can go on this website, type in their community and find information in their language. So that should be going up in about two weeks. And uh, we're hoping that um, we're gonna be partnering with UN agencies on that and indigenous organizations from the seven regions to try to set this up for the future, not just for COVID-19, but for other important information that we need to get out there. And there's potential in this um, to, to really, I feel, to make a difference. And so these are some of the things that, um, that I think um, we would like synergy on and that we've seen that uh, that would play a role. Um, so we've been getting, you know, individual requests from from people in communities who don't have access to physicians, uh, who don't have access to medical advice. Um, and we've seen that there is an increased need uh, for telemedicine. Um, and it would have been really helpful to have some sort of telemedicine network in place before this started that could reach indigenous communities. Um, obviously, there are Wi-Fi issues and stuff like that. So the real solution would be to get care into the communities on the ground. Um, but because of legal structures um, during this time, a lot of telemedicine wasn't able to occur. And uh, there weren't legal mechanisms to be able to give medical advice to indigenous peoples. Uh, and I feel like that has, has hurt a lot of communities during this time who need advice on this new virus. Um, but we, are, we have been able to provide technical guidance. There's a community next week that's meeting with five of the physicians on our team um, to help develop their COVID-19 response plan. So that's somewhat helpful, but we would like to see something uh, more, to develop something more robust and stronger in the future. Um, also, fundraising most of the communities we're, we're partnering with um, are dealing with food insecurity and so we are going to be going through a fundraising campaign to try to help raise funds not only for food but for biosecurity 
uh, materials, as we've heard from our, our Kuna sister, that, that's, that's very much needed. And then to uh, try to bolster this, this translation effort and do it in a way that empowers indigenous peoples instead of using their time. Um, I know for a lot of communities for the, you know, who especially are losing their languages, a lot of the translators often get asked to translate so many things, but they're not um, being empowered for their time. We want to figure out a way to be able to do that um, while we're able to, to spread vital information. Um, so these are some of the lessons that we've learned through this process, and it's, it's been a real honor to be able to partner with so many indigenous leaders um, in, the, in these efforts. And uh, yeah, we're really excited to talk about how we can you know, make this, these efforts stronger and create more um, unification amongst the various things that we're doing. Uh, so thank you everyone for your time. It's really an honor to be here. Well, thank you so much, Victor, for sharing that uh, very inspiring uh, presentation. In fact, all the presentations today have been very inspiring. And it's been an honor uh, for me to serve as moderator today. We're going to be opening it up for questions in just a moment. As you can see in the chat icon, uh, you can type in your questions in English or Spanish uh, in that using the chat feature. But uh, before we go on, I've mentioned a few times that the uh, Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, Francisco Cali, was scheduled to come in and uh, provide an update for us today. Uh, unfortunately, he has not uh, been able to get on the line. He has a lot of competing meetings happening. So um, what I want to just do before we, we start taking questions is just make sure that people know that uh, what's going on uh, with the Special Rapporteur, what, are, what is something that he would share. And if you can take a look at the screen right now, um, the Special Rapporteur is, uh, has a questionnaire out uh, with submissions due by June 15th. So the deadline is coming right up and it's really important. He's asking for um, information on the impacts of COVID-19 on the human rights of indigenous peoples. So you can find this questionnaire uh, at the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights uh, website, uh, as well as uh, at the IITC website a number of times uh, during uh, this event today, this panel today, I've uh, put in the chat feature a way to contact the presenters with a link. If you click on that same link, you'll be able to also reach that uh, questionnaire at the, uh, via the IITC website. Again, the UN Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, Francisco Cali, is calling for uh, submissions and that's by June 15th if you if you type in and go to the OHCHR website there is an uh, there is an error it states both the 15th and the 19th of June as the due date but we've confirmed with the special rapporteur that the actual date is the 15th so uh, with that I'm going to stop sharing my screen and we will well it looks like it says uh, somebody's writing that uh, the deadline has been extended to the 19th Again, we've heard from the Special Rapporteur that the submission should be in by the 15th. So uh, this is directly from him. And uh, we'll continue on until we, uh, with that uh, information until we hear otherwise. So right now, uh, we're opening up uh, four questions, uh, either from uh, the panelist or, or that there was a person again who typed in just now, is there a way to turn off the mic of the translator? We've put in the chat. A number of times you need to click your language that you want to hear if you're English then click mute original audio mute original audio if you don't do that you will continue to hear uh, both languages so I'm wondering while we're waiting for uh, some questions to come in if any of the panelists uh, would like to say anything about how uh, the recent um, demonstrations and, and mobilizations on uh, black rights and police brutality, if they've also affected uh, the communities in any way, or how have uh, youth also been uh, connecting to that in relation and while uh, the COVID pandemic is going on? Anybody could take that question while we wait to see if anything else comes up in the chat feature.
So again, uh, just for any of the youth who might want to uh, respond about how have, uh, have there been any intersections between uh, what's going on with the Black Lives Matter uh, movement, uh, your communities, and how has this uh, been affecting you since the COVID-19? If we don't have any comments on that. I can respond. To yeah, sure. That. Go ahead, Victor. And then we have a couple of questions now coming in. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, I, I just do want to give the space to recognize the serious historical injustices that have been occurring towards our Black relatives for hundreds of years. And um, just to recognize that Indigenous peoples, we are allies in this fight. And uh, many of the same um, issues that are being you know, brought up that are impacting Black communities also impact us. And I think that um, there is definitely a need for discussion on how we are able to um, address those issues, but do it in a way that, that is not um, taking away from the movement or saying like, um, you know, like going into uh, oppression Olympics type stuff, but recognizing that uh, the roots of police brutality, the roots of mass incarceration, um, the roots of, of police extrajudicial killings uh, are, are found in colonization. And the very founding of police um, was based off of patrolling slaves and um, making sure property, white property was being protected and also um, policing uh, indigenous peoples. And I think um, in, this, in this fight that's going on right now, it's very important that uh, we find a way to create synergy with our black relatives. Um, and we're seeing that um, in some ways already with the statues of Columbus being torn down alongside the statues of slave owners. Um, and I, I just think it's a really powerful moment um, where indigenous peoples and, and, and black uh, peoples can come together and, and create real change. Thank you very much, uh, Victor, for that. We do have another question coming in. Um, this time from India, Northeast India, how do we ensure that food and nutrition security is maintained uh, during this pandemic amongst uh, indigenous people's communities? This could be to any of the panelists again, how do we ensure that food and nutrition is maintained uh, during this pandemic? I, I can answer that question. All right, Chris. Um, so, um, in order to, to uh, maintain um, food and nutrition security during this time, I think um, one of the steps that we've been taking to make sure um, we protect those things is to um, collect our seeds and to uh, take stock of what seeds we have. And if we don't have seeds, where are our seeds? Indigenous peoples, um, especially uh, uh, my peoples have, have a variety of, of land race heirloom seeds. And I, I would say that um, most indigenous communities have their own seeds. And so that is one thing that's very important is to look for those seeds and to protect them. Because in the future, um, when there is another pandemic, um, when people are panic buying and, and buying all the groceries in the stores, that leaves indigenous communities with with um, less food. And so what we need to do is to be able to, to find our seeds, grow them out, and share them with other indigenous um, communities uh, across the world because food security right now is a major issue um, when it comes to indigenous communities. And this crisis had made, has made things a lot worse. So what we're doing now is to empower other indigenous uh, youth farmers and, and growers and ranchers to continue to, to learn how to sustainably grow their foods, how to sustainably um, uh, take care of their livestock. And so that is one thing um, that we need to do, but to also remember to share with each other um, any knowledge that we may have um, when it comes to traditional agriculture and, and food as well. So that's one thing that we have been uh, working on to do is to get resources out to indigenous farmers and uh, ranchers so that they are able to produce more food in the future. Thank you very much, Chris, uh, for that. I don't know if any of the other panelists uh, want to comment, but we do have some other questions. 
and uh, I would like to try to get uh, to some of those other ones. Uh, this question comes in from Cindy. What steps has the COVID-19 Indigenous Health Partnerships taken to address the problems of Indigenous peoples living with disabilities? So again, uh, what steps has the COVID-19 uh, health par uh, partnerships taken to address the problems of Indigenous peoples living with disabilities? Yeah, it's a really good, really good question and so important um, because we know Indigenous peoples with disabilities are um, some of the most Im um, impacted because a lot of the, the the steps that governments take to make things accessible overlook the unique challenges Indigenous peoples with disabilities have as opposed to um, the majority populations with, with disabilities. And we've heard that from a lot of people from um, the Indigenous Peoples Disabilities Caucus um, at the, the permanent forum. And, and um, as of now, I, I can't say that we've done very much around it because we haven't really found uh, 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 too many people who can help us do sign language. And um, the, the best thing that we're doing right now is, is creating info through audio. So if there are indigenous peoples um, who are, are visually challenged, uh, we're able to reach them that way, but we don't have any information in Braille and it's very difficult because a lot of indigenous peoples um, we're finding are, uh, they speak sign languages in different languages. So um, we're able to find like American sign language, but uh, not all indigenous people speak that. So if you have uh, resources on, on that or how to get in touch with, people um, who can help us with that. We'd love to talk to them. Thank you very much, uh, Victor, for that response. Also, uh, it might be interesting to contact the uh, Indigenous Peoples uh, with Disabilities Caucus. They, they also uh, function through uh, the system during the permanent forum, and we could try to link you up with that, uh, with that caucus as well. Uh, next question comes from Andrea Carmen. Uh, how can older indigenous leaders support the inclusion of indigenous youth in emerging leadership? Maybe I can go fast with that. Sure, go ahead. Yeah, um, thank you, Andrea. And we really appreciate opportunities like this one uh, because it makes sure that the youth uh, find a space to get the to participate or to meaningfully engage in intergenerational uh, knowledge transfer. And so this is inspirational in a way. And so actually in a great way. And such webinars or when after COVID, post COVID-19, such opportunities are very powerful. Just like this webinar to have uh, elders who uh, all the members of the, of the Indigenous Peoples' Rights Movement uh, sharing the, the platform that they have with the youth. Uh, another way is to have um, focal point, youth focal point positions within uh, the spaces that we have as Indigenous Peoples' Movement. Like for example, in climate change, uh, in food, uh, food systems uh, and such themes. So, if you have such uh, opportunities, we have a lot of youth who are yearning uh, for these opportunities. Uh, those are my thoughts. Thank you, Robert. Thank you so much. We're, we're uh, running into the last five minutes of our time here. And uh, we do have a number of other really good questions. I, I just wanna, I'm gonna take uh, Jessica, I see her raising her hand. Uh, I'll take you, you in just a moment, but remember you can contact the speakers directly. Uh, through that link and I'll share it again uh, before we go. So let me just turn over to Jessica before we give our, our uh, closing here. Yeah. Thank you very much. I would like to share a few things to some of the questions that were asked previously, especially when we talk about intergenerational um, sharing. This is an organization of indigenous youth in indigenous territories. And it's really important to have the support of our elders who have worked for so many years in order to be able to share these very important spaces. For example, like the Permanent Forum, 
the special rapporteur. I think that this is so fundamental for us. And your support as expert is important because in this way, we can have we can have the participation of the uh, Global Indigenous Youth Caucus can participate in a more forceful way. And then we can also participate at the UN spaces. And I also want to say that at the Indigenous Global Caucus, we have been working for more than two years to have an international forum with FAO, especially in relationship to food and nutrition. And I wanna highlight this because in the presentation that I made, I mentioned that the Indigenous Caucus and Indigenous Youth have been working on human rights in different spaces. The pandemic has really shown us that there is an inequality in exercising our rights. And it's so important for us to use these different forms because we do believe that we still have many challenges to face in order to continue using these different platforms. And I wanted to say about actions that we need to take in the, uh, with the Afro-American movement and the Afro-descendants. I believe that at, as indigenous peoples, it's so important when we talk about collective human rights, includes everyone. And in Latin American region, we have been going through, for example, there was an attempt made against um, our brother in Guatemala, they, they murdered one of our indigenous medical doctors because the indigenous youth are, we're, we're really the future. So we have to protect all these different avenues of our knowledge as indigenous peoples. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. So we're coming to the end of our time. Again, if you look in the chat, uh, we have shared a number of times and I'll share it once more. Uh, contact information to our presenters. Uh, I want to thank everybody who's just did a, a really inspirational job uh, today. I'm, I was really honored to be a moderator for this program. Uh, my name is Roberto Borrero, representing the United Confederation of Taino People. Uh, next week, we will be coming back uh, with another webinar. This time, the focus will be climate change. Uh, before we close out, I also want to uh, thank our translators. Uh, they do an excellent job. Uh, here and really help us to expand the message across uh, these uh, language borders. And I want to thank uh, Chris and everyone else at IITC who helped uh, behind the scenes to make sure that everything went smooth today. Uh, with that, I want to uh, thank you all again. I hope that you can tune in with us again next week, the same time. And uh, keep look, a lookout at the IITC website because we did record today's program and we hope to have that recording up as soon as possible. So thank you again. I say hahom, itunokena atiaono. Thank you, sisters and brothers, uh, for your time with us today. <laughs>